<laughs> Welcome to our awesome panel, uh, Finding the Right Comms for Your Community. Uh, I have with me three super awesome people who manage different uh, open source communities and who have used uh, a lot of different tools. Um, yep. <laughs> so uh, why don't, uh, we'll just go here from my left. If you can introduce yourself and um, say your favorite number because this is one of my favorite icebreaker questions. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Jocelyn Matthews, and 42. <laughs> um, hey everyone, my name is Naya Macklin. Um, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. And um, I would say my favorite number is 1966. And that is because that was the year that the Black Panther Party had founded and started in Oakland, California. A Little bit of history for you. <laughs> I'm Dave Clements. Uh, my favorite number is either zero or, eight, zero or eight, and you can talk to me afterward if you really care. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm Sarah Kaiser. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. Um, and my favorite number is pi. I'm a little bit irrational about this. Um, also, because my username literally everywhere is crazy, the number four pi, 314. It was my first internet username, as you may guess, and I just never left it, so I like Pi. Awesome, so to make sure we have enough time for lots of stuff, um, I'm going to, the first question for, for y'all um, is kind of what platforms do you actually use for your communities and what types of communications happen on them? Because you may have even more than one that you kind of, people bounce back and forth between. So. Uh, let's mix it up. Dave, you go first. Oh, okay. I, I sat down here for a reason, Sarah. So. You can't cheat off of everybody else's answers. Oh, come on. Okay. Um, so I work with the Conda community, and we use Matrix slash Element for chat. So that's informal. We have lots of channels, lots of stuff going on. It can be a torrent if you subscribe to everything. Um, we use Discourse for Q&A. So that's longer form discussions, longer form answers, questions. Um, so we encourage that. We have a mailing list for announcements that we don't currently use, but we will be setting that up, or we will be starting to use that shortly. So those, and we also have a website, community website. So those are our main platforms. Yeah, so um, for um, my role at Suborbital, um, oh, sorry, I'm a developer advocate at a company called Sporbital, which does uh, WebAssembly extensibility and adaptability. Um, but we, for our internal, like, community-based um, conversations, we use a, a, a tool called Threads, which I think is um, a pretty, pretty early tool. Um, it's a, a, a tool that prioritizes asynchronous communication, right, rather than uh, focusing on synchronous, especially that we have a very global team. Um, and so we use that mainly for our internal communications, and then uh, we also use Discord to engage with our de fellow developers, um, uh, as well as doing Q&A, um, and um, we have um, mailing lists, et cetera, as well to do more announcements, um, conversations, um, and uh, also, like, if you just think about the social media platforms, then, like, YouTube and Twitter and all those to communicate with folk in general as well. Um, I'm Jocelyn Matthews, she, they, and I'm here mainly in the guise of being an admin at the DevRel Collective. Mm -hmm. And so we are using Slack. Uh, it's an older community. It's been around for over a decade, and I can dig into that a little bit later. Um, also, uh, professionally, I've used Discord, Discourse, uh, your Facebook groups, if anybody remembers those, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and things like mailing lists, you know, going way back. Sweet. Um, yeah, I'm a community manager for a couple different open source uh, groups and nonprofits, and because a lot of them are pretty new, we are almost entirely on Discord. <laughs> so um, I have set up a lot of Discords, and um, it was also kind of at the time as we were making those decisions, um, one of the few that had good kind of code of conduct gating stuff. So a lot of the kind of security things and safety were important for our community. Um, cool. So, question two. Um, <laughs> were you involved with choosing your current platforms? And if so, what aspects of your community were kind of factored into those decisions? Um, and if not, uh, what would be your top priorities if you 
got the opportunity for a clean slate. Uh, we all know it's like kind of hard to move people <laughs> once they're already somewhere. Um, but if you could like blank clean slate it, what would you want to do? Uh, we'll start with you, Nylee. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I, I'm going to mix it up. You've got to pay okay. attention. But I'm ready for it. All right. So number one, again, thank you all so much for coming. And thank you all so much for being here and bearing with me and um, bearing with us. Um, so I would say I did not have uh, a say in the community platforms that we had chosen. Um, so it was pretty much our director level. We're like, hey, we're going to try this out. And we're like, hey, we're going to try this out. We're very much a small startup, 11 people. So um, we can be as flexible as we need for whatever size our community continues to grow to. Um, but um, so because I was not in those particular conversations, um, uh, what I specifically am looking for at all times is that we're able to have both moderation and safety within our community. I think, you know, that to me is are some of the most or some of the highest um, uh, some of the most important priorities for just myself as both a developer advocate and an engineer and someone who wants to be in, in, in community, right? Um, and so thinking about what are the, um, uh, what are the uh, ways in which we um, communicate with each other um, and how can we ensure that that communication is safe at all times? Um, how can we foster communication between folk um, and um, ensure that folk are um, feeling both um, uh, that they can um, that they can uh, be their fullest self in this space, but also at all times just feel as safe as possible. Um, so safety is a, a huge priority. Um, having a sense of community as well is really huge. So, you know, when dealing with engineers, um, a lot of a lot of the times, as, as a developer advocate, um, you might feel well on the pre-sales side of things. You might feel like you're doing a lot of like external comms with folk and, and pushing content to folk, but not really, you know, creating a community of conversation there. Um, and so uh, when choosing out platforms, I'm thinking about like what ways can we both um, inherently foster that conversation organically, I would say, organically foster that conversation and communication piece, um, whereas it might be difficult on other platforms. Um, so yeah, that'll be some things we prioritize. Jocelyn? Um, the question again was about legacy, basically. Uh, yeah, did you have any kind of choice in the matter of what platforms you're using? Okay. Um, and if you didn't, uh, what would you, what would be your considerations in picking stuff now, kind of having experience with those sure. existing platforms? Okay. Um, so just for context, anyone who's not familiar with the DevRel Collective, it is a volunteer run group for uh, peers who are working professionals in the field of technical community or developer relations. Um, so it is deliberately a community that is private because a lot of us also might work for companies that are competitors and we just need to be able to talk to each other candidly without having that kind of like guard up. So it's very much a community where what happens in the conversations happen um, in the community, they stay in the community and they're not citable. So you can't say something like, oh, so-and-so in the DevRel Collective told me this mm -hmm. um, and it just keeps everything nicer <laughs> for everybody um, so the main factor as i said because we're volunteer run was that it be free and the community is over a decade old so at that time what was like cutting edge you know you're looking at slack um, as to whether we would make that decision today I'm not sure. Um, migration carries a cost with it, and I've done migrations. It's 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 not fun, even when you're getting paid for it, and none of us are getting paid. Um, but one limitation of Slack is that Slack is made for people who are forced to, to speak to each other, which I don't mean in a bad way, but you can't just wake up one morning and be like, you know what, I'm going to block my boss. I mean, it, work groups don't don't function like that. Um, so when you take that outside of a context where people are required to speak to each other and it's built around that supposition, uh, moderation does become an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but luckily we haven't really had any disasters in that, in that vein. That is good. Yeah. Dave, what you got? 
So I'm coming at it from the opposite angle of Jocelyn. We wanted something that was as open as possible mm -hmm. and that didn't require a login to see stuff. We could link to particular discussions. Um, so we picked Matrix for that because it is open. You don't have to log in. Um, let's see. We also, uh, we also picked um, Discourse for the same reasons. Um, it's very easy to link to stuff. We want that to become a, a long-term resource for the community. Uh, we picked both of those because they're free. Okay. And we also valued history. So we wanted history. Mm -hmm. um, and we can get that with both of those. Uh, yeah. So those were our main reasons. And yeah, um, I was the one involved in, in, in picking those. And we can get to that later about why we were motivated to settle on those. But. Mm, why were you? Well, that's the next question, maybe. <laughs> Let's see. And zero and eight, remember to, no, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I kind of said a little bit before about why I, I did get to pick all of our kind of platforms, um, and I spent probably way too long making pros and cons lists. But yeah, we did end up on Discord uh, kind of for two main reasons. One, it the moderation capabilities mm -hmm. felt kind of, at least at the time, which was like mm, three years ago, um, at least the most advanced of the tools that we could find. Yeah. Um, it was something that a lot of the folks in the community we're already familiar with because teaching a new platform like it's already hard enough to get them to like click and want to continue to engage so if you pick something that they're already perhaps have on their phone or are using that was kind of what pushed us is like yeah it's not open source but it's accessible <laughs> um, and the other was it was one place where we could have voice and video and text chats which at the time um, one of my personal biggest pet peeves is, oh, hey, what's the Zoom link for this call? Uh, I didn't get it. Or is that the old one? And then your meeting starts 15 minutes late because you've been going back and forth <laughs> to different Zoom rooms or Jitsi rooms or whatever. Um, so it was just really convenient for like our community calls to be like, yep, there's the community call voice channel. That is where we will always be. There is no ambiguity. <laughs> um, and gave us also kind of a nice uh, place for like co work, casual co working or kind of debugging sessions, jams, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so the next question, since we are going pretty, pretty quick here. Um, no platform is perfect. Uh, what challenges have you run into with your current setup? Um, were there any catastrophes or things that did kind of force a migration? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> um, catastrophes, oh, what could possibly go wrong <laughs> in running a community? Um, <laughs> So I think one of the, the challenges that we tend to run into at DevRel Collective, uh, a lot of them just have to do with the fact that we're on the free tier. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think anybody who's on the free tier with Slack is familiar with the rolling deletes. Um, that is something that, you know, for example, when moderating, it can be kind of a bear to go back and review, uh, like to see if someone's got a pattern of creating, you know, like non-optimal issues in the community because those things disappear. So that puts extra work on us for documentation. Um, probably you might be interested in some of the workflow stuff around that later if we have time for it. Um, so yeah, mainly the, the rolling deletes are a problem um, and just everything that has to do with the free tier. Many times there are things that we would like to do uh, to modify or customize the community and then we run into um, limits on customizations uh, I understand they're a business, but it's just, I don't want to pay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard when it's all volunteer, right? There isn't like a, an organization you can kind of appeal to <laughs> for, yeah. for funding. Yeah, and, and we don't want there to be. Um, like mm -hmm. that's kind of key to what we're doing is that we don't, we're not looking for a sponsor. We're not looking to monetize. We're not looking to create a course that somebody's gonna, like we, we literally just, that's a non-goal. Right. So we just sort of live with it. If we, going back to your previous question, if we were picking something today, um, Discord might be something that we would look at, but like I said, migration's a bear. Uh, Niley. 
Yeah. Um, so uh, yes, 100%. No platform is perfect, but I am. <laughs> I love me some Discord. Uh, Discord is so lovely. Um, it's accessible. It is free. Um, uh, so those are some huge benefits. And um, I, I'm not speaking specifically for suborbital, but there's lots of different um, organizations and communities that I'm in that have a, a, like about 40,000 engineers in there, right? And just the moderation capabilities of Discord, um, as well as the bots that you can create to, um, to plug into Discord uh, are, are incredible. Um, and so when I'm um, juxtapositioning that against, right, uh, uh, um, a platform like Slack, you can really see the, the limitations of Slack's capabilities when it comes to like the, um, uh, just the breadth of the um, types of, um, just the, thing, the types of things that you can do, right, with, with uh, Discord versus Slack. So we've run into things um, uh, in Slack as well where we're looking to create some Slack bots, um, for example, and, and that, that's just made more difficult um, when you're thinking about like pricing and things like that. Um, and um, just the capabilities are, are much more limited. So um, when we're thinking about scaling our organization, then Discord, I think, has been the, the true win, um, allowing us to have conversation um, and, and really build a, a really robust community um, in ways that, that Slack has not been able to provide for us so far. So, and to your question about like whether there have been some catastrophes, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I think if you're in this field and catastrophes haven't happened, like, wow, that's beautiful. Um, but luckily, uh, well, not luckily, but yes. So when we're thinking about um, a catastrophe that happened, it happened in, in Slack for one of the communities that I'm a part of. And this was a case where um, the person who um, was uh, in a more leadership position in the organization, this was a nonprofit technical organization. Um, the uh, a person who was in leadership position, we were um, trying to re think about what power looks like within this space and what democratizing power looks like could look like in that space because we had felt like that particular person might have a bit too much power um, and it, it, it'll be better to spread that out amongst the amongst the community as well and it was a community decision that made that happen um, so uh, when we're thinking about like what as a as a slack admin like what different folk can see as a member of the, the Slack organization, right? What you can see, what you can't see. Sometimes you can see DMs and things like that when you're um, a part of the admin um, for a particular organization in Slack. And so that accessibility or that, that like clear um, uh, it could be, you know, could be privacy issues, um, and especially when there are issues between the community versus that particular person in um, in power, as you would say. So, um, uh, we uh, we didn't necessarily figure out the best solution for that. Um, but I would say that we uh, we worked around the platform that we were focused on in order to make sure that that was more democratized. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so we were, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say we were a catastrophe, but we weren't coherent. Mm. Um, we had stuff on Google Groups, we had stuff in Gitter, we had stuff on Slack. And there are different people in each of those three, and we wanted to bring all three of them together. Um, so that was the long-term plan. When Slack added its 90-day limit from the 10,000 message, that sped us up, because we need that history. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there wasn't a catastrophe per se, but that's what we have. Um, so I'm really happy with discourse for q and I have no complaints about discourse whatsoever. It's not open source. Okay, that's one complaint. Um, yes. But for Matrix and Element, um, it could be more polished. So it's not as nice as Slack or Discord in terms of polish. Um, it works. You can do almost everything you want to do in a chat client but the polish isn't there. And so it takes new users a while to figure out notifications. There's just a bunch of things that are more friction than with more mature platforms. Uh, we still think it's worth a trade-off because we get the openness, which was a core value of the project. Okay. Um, so I would not change. One thing I want to ask this audience, um, we tried to get a Zulip person on the panel and we weren't able to do that. So if you have experience with Zulip, that would be great to hear about. Um, I have the suspicion that maybe if I had to do it again, I would go with Zulip instead of Matrix, but I don't know that. So, Dave, what is Zulip, by the way? Zulip is a, 
Okay. Yeah, yes, here we that's go. Right. <laughs> they are not paying me, Let by the know. way. Okay. Um, uh, so Zulip is a chat interface that forces threading. So Beautiful. it's like discourse that way, but it doesn't feel like discourse. It feels like a chat. Wow. Yeah, so it's a really fine line it walks, but it also has a learning curve. Mm -hmm. And so that's one reason not to adopt it is because people are used to things like Discord and Slack. Mm -hmm. Matrix is much more like Discord and Slack than it is like Zulip. Mm -hmm. But communities like Rust that have migrated to Zulip, they love it. Nobody loves Matrix. They like it, they use it, <laughs> but the love isn't there. But mm. for Zulip, it's, it's love. Oops, sorry. Oh. Uh, I'll add my answer and then we'll do open questions. Because um, <laughs> I didn't want this to sound like an ad for, for Discord, <laughs> even though I love oh, it a lot. Yeah. Um, the thing that we struggle with a lot is just the notification system mm -hmm. and our mm -hmm. configuration for the platform is awful. <laughs> and. Again, not exactly a catastrophe, but we've had a lot of, I've had to field a lot of complaints about people who didn't know how to manage, like, mm. there are settings if you kind of dig into it and you can kind of customize what you get notified about. Um, and there are now much nicer ways as a, an admin to adjust that, but uh, I had people somehow getting permissions to at everyone everywhere. <laughs> And then no. people were just like rage quitting, and I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> we will triage this immediately. Mm. <laughs> um, so yeah, like that's kind of if even if we can nicely onboard them, if they're just being barraged with every notifications for every chat, it's kind of awful. So, uh, so yeah, I'm gonna open it up to any sort of questions that you have for the panel, uh, and I'm gonna run around with the mic. <laughs> So I think someone here had. Oh, okay, cool. Wow, <laughs> beautiful, miraculous. Uh, for things like Discord, what sort of automations do you use, and what would you prioritize if you were starting with a community with no automation? Mm -hmm. um, where where would you start? I'm on Slack, unfortunately, but I'm gonna port your ideas over. <laughs> Go for it. Um, I'm, I haven't used uh, Discord in a while, but, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 you're good. Um, let's see, what sort of automations? Um, well, I think that there are capabilities for, um, oh, there's so much. Okay, now, now I'm remembering, there's so much. <laughs> um, so we, we create bots everywhere <laughs> to do everything. So, um, for example, when a um, uh, when someone from the community has a particular question for like the core team, we've created a bot that will um, allow like put it into a queue that will then be ported over to um, uh, to the core teams like. Um, like a, it'll just be a cue that we can then like go on and answer in detail, check off and keep it moving. Um, so that's been really, really helpful to just organize um, community conversation. Um, and then um, there's ways to like, uh, to create and facilitate feedback that way as well. Um, uh, we have um, bots that will, uh, or like for automation in general, that will help us um, like facilitate when we're um, uh, streaming to Twitch as well. So the, the partnership between there, um, we're, we have uh, bots that will like um, moderate the text that's going through the, the stream on Twitch. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, which will allow like, if you're, if you're, if you say, for example, one of a flagged word that we have, then we'll have a bot that'll um, like let that person know, hey, this is, you know, this, these are our community guidelines. These are the, um, the things that we've all abided by this particular, you know, frame or context or word um, does not abide by those community guidelines. Please refrain from using it. Um, et cetera. Oh, seems to have gone out. But, oh, Great you're the best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then, uh, uh, and if they then, you know, continue to, to use that particular word or phrase, whatever, then it will escalate it up to us, or you can do an automatic, like, um, like temporary ban and then permanent ban um, based on violating the COC guidelines, et cetera. So, yeah, lots of different things there. Mm hmm. Uh, I can't. Well, I did too. Well, I can yell. Okay. <laughs> okay. It doesn't need to be Discord specifically. I'm actually okay. not on Discord. Okay. Um, so Matrix also supports a lot of plugins. It's an open system. It has open APIs. 
Um, when we were migrating off of Slack, we built a bridge. And that's a credit to Slack, too, because they allowed us to do that. Um, so that bridge exists. It's out there. I can't remember the details. But everything that was posted in one place went to the other as well and vice versa. And it worked 98% of the time. So that gave us some time to do the move and to let people know. Um, I haven't explored it beyond that, but there is a huge ecosystem out there. So. Um, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can talk a little bit. Um, I, like I said, I haven't used Discord in a while, um, but Naya just covered a bunch of really good stuff. So um, I can talk about automations on Slack. Mm -hmm. So uh, and we actually have another one of the admins who just joined in uh, in the audience too. Mm -hmm. So the workflow that we have for people joining the Slack is partially automated. So as I said before, we're not looking to throw open the gates to everybody in the world. And in fact, we're actively looking to keep some people out. So for example, we get a lot of um, tech recruiters who would love to join and go fishing. So uh, we do have a type form and the type form has a little bit of logic in it that will select some people out. So for example, it will ask, what is your job title? And it's like if you're, I don't know, Mr. Big Shot, CEO, slash founder, slash, 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 mm -hmm. then you will get a message that says perhaps this isn't the space for you and a link to some other resources that actually would be helpful for that situation. The type form goes to uh, our GitHub, like it creates a GitHub issue. So for each person who wants to join the group, a uh, GitHub issue is automatically created. And then we have a road out on our team where we move through in batches um, each week and go and address the, the stack of whoever wants to, uh, wants to be joining. We also have some automation around welcoming to people to the group. So there's, you know, like a little welcome bot type situation. I have notes here. Uh, I'm not like just texting a friend. <laughs> um, You're not so, on yeah, Slack we have right the, now. We have the tracking in GitHub. Um, and then we also have something um, in our admin group, which is a bot that lets people know when they're on shift to be um, doing stuff. So I would say those are, do we have any other main automations that you can think of off the top of your head? Those are the main ones. Dictator bot? Yeah, yeah our, our friendly dictator bot. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, anyway, I hope that's helpful. So as a recent arrival at DevRel, I highly recommend it. It's a great community. <laughs> So. Welcome, friend. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think yeah. there was a question. For oh, that. Um, I was going to add in quick one that I really love uh, on Discord um, is there's events on Discord, but uh, there's um, some bots that allow you to connect like a Google Calendar uh, for like your community calls and stuff like that. It's very tedious to enter them in manually, but it'll basically sync those events that are on Discord, especially if you're hosting them on Discord, then it just... And then people can set up their own little reminders of when they want to show up for those things. So it's a, it's a nice way to reduce maintainer effort. Anyway. Right. Uh, I've maintained uh, communities on Slack for a long time, and I'm really used to how that works. And generally, like, m the majority of people who join the Slack participate in a channel at some point. Mm -hmm. Now I'm responsible for a community on Discord, and I'm looking at the same stats, and I'm only seeing, like, 10% of the people who join, like connect to the Discord server ever say anything. Mm -hmm. And about half of the people who join the server are brand new to Discord as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, is that normal or is there something we should be doing different to increase our um, like new member activation? Can I, can I ask a clarifying question? Which is what is, the, what is the age bracket of the people joining your Discord? I have no idea. <laughs> Discord doesn't tell me that. Um, I, I thought maybe all, you might have a, a finger on the pulse. Uh, because... they're, they're, um, they're all professional age, so I would say like late 20s and the 40s. The, the reason I ask is that I've been taking some classes, like uh, some college classes online, like for various, you know, like language classes and stuff. And the thing that I've noticed is that every class that I joined spontaneously the students just spin up a Discord. Like it's, it's just an automatic thing that they do, which is not the case when I was in college previously. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering if you might find over time that that new to Discord uh, thing st sorts to uh, sort itself out over time. 
Okay. Uh, what about the, the new members talking? Is it normal for a lot of people to join a server and just never talk? I'll leave it to the Discord yeah. professional. <laughs> I have seen this happen. I've seen this happen quite a lot, truly. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think um, I wouldn't, you know, I don't, I'm, I don't have the stats for every Discord, but I would say that in the Discords that I've been a part of, a majority of people will join the Discord and just make sure that they have it as a resource, right? That they can tap in whenever they want to. Um, whenever they want to be active, they have that, so they're logged into the server. Um, uh, but they won't uh, necessarily spend a lot of time engaging in that or um, if they don't have a call to engage or, or a reason to engage or feel right uh, a feel a sense of community in that space then they won't do a lot of that engagement they'll just you know uh, I say discord farm like have all the discord tabs open and just be able to mm -hmm. you know tap in whenever they want um, but then the question is like how do we start to like pull folk in and, and engage them and that's a whole nother conversation we can have at any time Question then too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, uh, I, I think the a, a, a next question that I would ask is that um, it would be the why are they joining the Discord? So is it just that they had saw that you're like, oh, like join our Discord, and they're like, sure, and then they join it, and then it's like. All right, I did it. You asked me to do that. All right, I'm going about my day, right? Um, or, or is it more of a sense of like my community is in this Discord, right? I want to be able to be in communication. I'm going to need help, and the people who are in this Discord can help me with my problems, right? Either those be dev problems. It could be anything. Um, uh, so um, I think that going to the why are people actually taking the time to join the Discord and understanding that fully can really help um, figure out like where um, where where we can tap folk in more and seeing right see getting a, a, a better understanding of that can help drive um, uh, some of the some of the reasons why they might engage further and then even just asking asking folk can be really helpful so why have you joined this discord and and then getting that feedback and then tailoring how y'all maneuver going forward can be really helpful as well I could maybe potentially add something because I've looked at a lot of the analytics just like you have. Um, we also, for a lot of our discords, there were a lot of people new to discord because we had, I mean, we had a lot of the student contributors and stuff, but we were working with academic groups that had like older professor and postdocs that were like, what is this discord thing? <laughs> um, so did do, we actually even did do a couple like pseudo training things <laughs> where I just said hop on a call with me yeah. you're gonna walk through how do you get on a call stuff like that um, but you know a couple years in now I've really seen that kind of shift and that percentage of people who join so on discord you actually have the ability to get three months rolling analytics if you're the server owner so that's honestly really like we use that a lot to kind of just keep track of um, because there's also like a partner status you can get if you have like enough active people. <laughs> so I've also thought a lot about how do you get people engaged. Um, as a community manager, I honestly just like went around and directly tried to talk to people. <laughs> like I'd drop interesting news articles. I'd encourage, I had a team of moderators as well. So I kind of encouraged them, hey, you see something interesting on social media or whatever. This is a cool paper, drop a link. And that did really kind of help prompt uh, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like the awkward thing at a party. You gotta put some icebreakers in there, but uh, between asking people to introduce themselves mm -hmm. when they join, you know, they had a, like a bot message that reminded them, hey, what are you interested in? Um, and with some of the new onboarding workflows in Discord, you can actually ask people, why are you here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they can select, and then that can be basically, it, information stored as a role for you as a maintainer to try and help, you know, then ping, hey, I'm new to learning this technology. Let's ping the newbies or something like that. Somebody over here with a question. One second. Zoom. You've actually already started talking about it, so I feel like it's a good time to ask it. Um, there's a lot of research that indicates that communication can be an incredible signal for how things are going in your project, whether or not that's amount of communication or sentiment or where people are having conversations. But I was just kind of curious about, one, is this, this is a practice you're doing? It sounds like you are already using some analytics where they're available. Um, but I've also kind of run into issues where not all platforms give you analytics. You have to go back in and add them later. And then we've been concerned about adding a monitoring view. People don't necessarily like to be watched talking, even though like they're already embedded analytics that are happening a lot of these tools already. So I'm just kind of curious how you navigate 
navigate that for platforms that you're either coming with analytics or you have to add them later and whether or not you're using that to kind of monitor health in your communities. So discourse does come with a lot of analytics um, and that's a feature. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as matrix goes, I got far enough to determine that there's an API and if I wanted to write the code, <laughs> I could do it, okay? Um, so matrix is not gonna stand out on that one. Um, I am a big fan of discourse because it's just there. You don't have to do anything to get it. I find the SQL Explorer helps a lot with mm. discourse too because you can start to customize in right. addition to the out of the box reports that it comes with. Is that a paid feature? I don't remember paying it's not? for it. Oh, very good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think there's a plugin that you have to install, but I don't. Okay. I don't remember paying for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have looked at doing custom bots before, and there are in the Discord ecosystem bots that will do much more detailed breakdowns of, you know, however invasive you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, I have not used those kind of for that reason because I didn't really want to infringe on people. Um, the Discord analytics are really pretty high level and they um, anonymize if the, or they omit if there's not a big enough sample size. But like I was seeing um, in our analytics, a lot of the population on one of our servers was in India. And so we kind of looked at that and decided that maybe we should run some more of our community calls in those time zones or at least try to split it up more because most of our admin team was in Europe or, or North America, so we decided to try out shifting some of those, and we got a lot more engagement, surprise, surprise. So um, just even some of those, the, the baked in Discord ones, they didn't seem too invasive. I definitely let people know, <laughs> like I, I posted as a mod, I'm like, hey, look, Discord collects these things. If you don't like it, I guess you have to leave. But <laughs> I'm not controlling Discord, but just so you know, I'm looking at these. Um, but they are only three months rolling, so I gotta remember <laughs> like every three months to download them. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, that was that was a um, a key issue that I um, have been trying to figure out, like how to navigate. I think, right? Like I'm I'm uh, I. I'm really big into thinking about like what does data privacy look like for folk, right? I'm mm -hmm. um, in protecting folks' data as much as possible, right? Um, and and if we are going to do data collection on folk and, and aggregation, et cetera, synthesization, right? What ways are we making sure that our community is informed about the data that we're collecting upfront, upfront, right? So that we're we're having a clear conversation with folk, um, and um, also like not just saying here's the data we collect, but here's the reasons why. We we think it's important to collect that data for our particular community, right? And how it's going to help inform X, Y, Z going forward. Um, and whether folk agree or disagree with those decisions, I think can really, really um, build up a, a, a community that's fostered on trust in really different ways. So, yeah, yeah I hear you on that, 100%. Is there any other questions? Oh, so many more questions. All right, we are almost out of time, so we can do maybe one or two more. <laughs> we did want the questions. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if anyone has experience with events on Discord that use video, um, because we were going to hold a hackathon on there, but then we dropped the event, and then all of a sudden 60 people signed up, and we said, oh, we thought maybe we'll get 20. Um, so now we're rethinking the platform. So I guess if you have any um, experience with that, um, it, does it does it work well for that platform? Is it better just for smaller events? Um, just curious to hear your thoughts on that. I, I've run a hackathon on Discord. <laughs> um, the, the caveat there, uh, really quick, is the all video to video channels right now are limited to 25 people, which kind of sucks. But they have stage channels where you can have, so that's basically when we had kickoffs for the hackathon, when we had like, Someone, we had like maintainers for the different open source projects give like a little five minute teaser pitch for their project and why you should come work with them. But the stage you can show video and stuff, but it's just a much more restricted set of people and then everyone else just kind of watches the stage. So that worked for us. 
No, yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. Um, the stage process has been has been wonderful. That's what we've used it primarily for is using their stage capabilities. And we've had about a thousand people within the audience, um, and it's worked perfectly, no issues. So, um, but we haven't had the like like if you would do a one on one conversation, video conversation with someone, we have not tested that out on Discord. Yeah, we, we ended up having like a bunch of breakout rooms <laughs> where it was mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, these students were working with this maintainer and they wanted a minute to go like workshop something. We just kind of had that set up for them. But yeah, okay. And one other question real quick. I shouldn't have run back. <laughs> um, so uh, we all have many communication tools on our, on our laptops or phones. Um, have you have any experience with consolidation tools uh, to help the end users that are participating in Slack and Discord and Signal and et cetera, et cetera? So some platforms support bridges. You know, I mentioned that we used one for that. There are some communities that set those up permanently. We didn't want to do that. Um, that's not really consolidating, but it is making sure everybody talks to everybody. So beyond that, I don't have experience. Yeah, I've done, I've done Slack to discourse. Um, the problem was more about buy-in from the internal people at the company. Um, I, so I didn't get to explore it as fully as maybe I would have under another circumstance. Um, I seem to remember going from Slack to Discord. Like you could basically back, like say, like I want the last 20 messages in this particular thread to show up in Discord. Um, and I found it to be a better use case for um, subgroups in the community. So for example, if I had like not exactly super users, but people who are particularly interested in one particular feature, um, put them into a, discor a discourse group that was like closed just for them, and then sort of start piping some of the Slack discussions through. And it was a good way to bring uh, product and engineering discussions into the Slack without like so much typing. But I don't, I don't think that that gets all the way to what you're asking, which is a very good question. I was literally working on this on the train ride here <laughs> because something uh, that I'm, I'm working on revamping another community's Discord right now, and there's a nice kind of new forum feature on Discord, which does kind of feel like a, I don't know, it seems pretty nice, but I want those to be publicly searchable. I don't want like the information of like casual conversation memes. Like I don't really care if you can't find those on the web. Like the whole point is it's supposed to be a real casual, approachable people place. Mm -hmm. um, but I was actually looking and started making a bot to connect Discord forums to GitHub discussions so that there was a public because it's the same sort of data model. And so. Mm -hmm. um, I will have to say it is honestly pretty easy to spin up a Discord bot. Like I was just using the Python wrapper API, and so I'll keep you updated. <laughs> but yeah, I, I also struggle with this because I have literally every platform on everything, and I hate it. Um, this is why I really like Matrix. <laughs> I've been like hoping that there's an opportunity to use Matrix because having the kind of open protocol and bridging would be amazing, as opposed to making one-to-one -one connectors everywhere. But say love you. Cool. When you invent it, please do yeah. let us all know. <laughs> <laughs> please. I'm on Mastodon. You can, you can find any of us on socials. Please let us know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for being. I think we're at time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're over time. Uh, Dave. I'd like to thank uh, Sam in back, our AV person. Thank you. Sam. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank you, Sarah, yeah. because Sarah hey. was not our original moderator. <laughs> And she stepped into the breach yes. two days ago. Yes. All right. Because Sophia's travel budget was cut, and she apologizes for not being here. Right. So, yeah. thank you. Much love. This was super fun. These are conversations I've had so, so many times, and I always love finding out what other people use and, and kind of like what were the those deciding factors. Hopefully this was useful uh, to you all, whether you're looking to make a change or just trying to learn more about the ecosystem. Um, yeah, we'll be around. Thank you everybody for joining. Appreciate y'all. Thank, Thank you. you.